Hello, everyone. Thank you again for attending our fifth episode of Conversations on Conservation video blog series. So we had such an amazing turnout and we had so many questions afterwards. Eric and I really wanted to get a chance to answer all of them. So we thought it'd be a great idea if we got together another time and just recorded the questions that you guys asked so you could have an answer. So Erica, let's go ahead and get to it. This will be very short and this is for everyone who attended and registered and asked questions. We appreciate it so much. We love that you are engaged and asking questions. It's so important. So um, Erica, thanks so much again for joining us. Thank you. Thank you everyone. I'll be I'm very happy to be here. So our first question here. Um, this question says, if COCOS depends on financial funding from donors to continue service, how is that being sustained during the pandemic? Has there been any decrease in donations? Yes, unfortunately, just like um, everywhere in the world, um, yes, donations uh, decreased a little bit. People that was paying for low cost services, sometimes they cannot even pay for the low cost. So that's how, I for joins and helps. So you, our supporters, with your help, we are able to to give the, the cocos the money that they need so they can keep on running their services that are just life-saving efforts for the community animals. So that's basically the the, the answer. Um, I for being 50 years uh, in this. In, in this area and supporting other organizations, this is how important it is that you support us because now we can support them. Thank you, Erica. Our other question here. Um, so this person saying, I'm glad to have wildlife rehabilitators available to help with the wildlife caseload. As a wildlife rehabilitator myself, I am curious to know if the state of or federal health officials have placed restrictions on what kind of animals that can be admitted, given that the suspected origins of the COVID-19 virus has led to restrictions in admissions of certain species, such as bats. Well, um, I have to say that it's very unfortunate that we are not on the same page or the same level as Canada, the United States, or, any, um, or some other countries in wildlife rehabilitation. We, um, it's very basic. We are in a very basic state of it. We are also trying to uh, bring um, expertise and matters and resources available, especially in Spanish, because there are many resources in English, but we don't have as many in Spanish, and that's very unfortunate. So um, right now, there, to my knowledge, there are no state sure because uh, that's where I, um, I mean, I'm very in close contact with them. I'm also in close contact with federal authorities and they're up to date today. They have not released any um, updates or restrictions, anything regarding that. Um, bats, I wouldn't be worried to be honest. Uh, we are more worried about the species that we can actually get the disease to and um, we've being updated on that, there um, are there's a recent publication um, that is going to be published. I'm sorry, it's not published yet, and that study is right now what we are um, basing on to treat wildlife. So especially primates, bears, um, that's just the the main ones that we are trying to protect much more than the mm -hmm. other ones. But always we need to be safe. We have to have our um, protection equipment on. And uh, just be aware that we still know very little about our impact or the impact that COVID-19 may have on wild species. Right. Thank you, Erica. So we have another question here that says, um, are there any recorded cases of zoonosis being transferred from companion animals to jaguars or other wildlife? So with zoonosis, if you're meaning that uh, literally from animals to animals. And so yes, definitely distemper is the main one. 
um, canine distemper has been documented in raccoons, in quatties here. And basically we know that all the canine species and the felid wild species are prone to have it. So there are, have been a couple of studies about the strains because we have different strains on distemper and whether those come from dogs, domestic dogs, and they go to wildlife. And that's where I cannot give you a confirmation, but there is a high suspicion that that can be uh, true. And so we just need to be um, careful and just protect, vaccinate the domestic animals so we can prevent this on the wild species. Wow, that's really scary too. Thank you for that response, Erica. Um, okay, so we have another question here. Are many pets being relinquished due to lack of tourism? Fortunately, not as many as we, uh, we were terrified of. Mm -hmm. um, yes, it is a fact that people, families are struggling. Many have uh, gone back to where they belong, where they normally uh, originally were living at and so we have been encouraging everyone to uh, take sorry, their pets with them, um, supporting them in having health certificates, the vaccination required, um, carriers if needed. So we are trying to keep families together um, on that term. But also what we've seen is that in a, some other cases where pets were just left behind, not, not really push this as much because people sometimes are very afraid of um, not having uh, support or how people are going to react to that. So yes, some people have been left behind, but thankfully neighbors and other community members that have seen these, um, these animals just by themselves have been uh, stepped up and fed them Take them to taken them to the veterinary clinic um, if it's available their own private clinic or somebody else's or Coco's clinic. So at least community members are very engaged, um, not leaving any animal suffering and um, and just stepping in and re rescuing them. So that's actually a very important part of the Coco's project to empower the community members so they can rescue animals themselves and instead of being a shelter with just a couple of hundred animals that you can assist, you can assist 1,200, right? And um, so that's basically the difference between being a shelter and being a, an, a, a community clinic that, um, that is based on low cost services and also providing just whatever support um, rescuers need. So that's it. I love that. It's really education and it takes a village, right? I mean, this is like a perfect example. It takes a village. So um, we have another question. Um, does IFA bring dogs and cats to Canada to actually cut? We already answered that live. That's true. Um, okay, here we go. Here's another question. If jaguars get hit by cars and they're and the vets who operate on them save them or rehabilitate them, what happens? Well, it's a very interesting question because right now I'm dealing with that. Not myself, but yes, on some part of it. So on the south of um, the state, there was a jaguar, a male jaguar that was hit by a car just over a week ago. Um, he was taken to the zoo where there is a vet veterinary clinic and the facilities to keep him confined and under observation. So, so far he has been okay, um, but he needs some extra um, studies. So we, as I4, are going to sponsor his um, checkup for uh, blood work. His blood work and some x-rays that the veterinarians need to understand why is he limping on one side and what it will take for him to be totally rehabilitated and, um, and physically healthy to be able to go back to the wild. So that's, um, that's how we also participate and, and support the government because the Jaguar is under 
um, extinction, like it's uh, near extinction, um, it's a protected species, so all the decisions regarding their health and uh, anything related to um, accidents like this one, it's them. The, the authorities are the only ones that uh, take the case and they just decide and they just request help if they need it. Wow, that's great. So the, the zoos are, are helping at that capacity. Yeah, we have one zoo here in the state of Quintana Roo. It's in the south, in the capital. And, um, and they are very engaged into rehabilitating uh, species that are, well, animals that are brought in. So they, are, they already have that program. Sometimes we don't understand that zoos have that um, position as well. It's part of, of what they do to uh, give back to the community and to the wild animals. So in this case, that is how they work in the north part and the um, central part of the state. Um, there are some wildlife rehabilitators, not as professional. Again, not, there's no uh, rehabilitation centers, just as you have in the States or Canada, but someday, someday we will get there, hopefully. Wow, thanks, Erica. We have another question here. Um, do you encourage people to keep their cats indoors? And how is that seen in the culture and the people? Yes, we very much encourage them to keep them indoors, um, especially, so Cocos, they, they have an adoption program. So every time they adopt a cat from Cocos, they are very persistent on that. There are also some infographics and um, messages that are put there out in, in, on Facebook or some other social media where we tell them what are they missing, where the cats are missing from being outside. And they are basically missing just negative stuff. So we want to encourage them to understand how uh, keeping a cat fine is perfectly fine. They will be much healthier. They won't um, be having any um, fights or any other disease that can be transmitted uh, through fights. And also, and very, very important, keep wildlife safe from cats. Yes. And how does... We just have parrots, wild birds, uh, lizards, snakes. Like, we are such a biodiverse state that we need to be very aware how harmful a predator in the wrong site and the damage that they can do. So cats, I love cats. Mm -hmm. I but I have a catio, and that's how I keep safe everyone. You know, wildlife, wild species, and also the cats from getting hurt. That's great. And how do um, the people who own the cats as pets, um, are they like, sure, I'll keep them inside? Or are they like, no, my cat deserves to be out? Like, what is the, the typical response? Well, on social media, after all these years of um, being persistent with the message, most of the people will reply or will give the advice that cats must be kept indoors. So that's great. That is great. That's fantastic news. Okay, let's see what else we have here. Um, So is dog meat trade uh, for consumption prevalent in Mexico in general? Does that exist there? Oh, thank God that's not a problem that we have here. Yeah, not even um, on the black market or something that we can prove. No, really uh, dog meat is not a problem. Mm -hmm. There was this problem when circuses were, um, I mean, we're still legal, and this be this has this has been um, this finished about five years ago. I'm I'm maybe a little bit more. I cannot tell for sure how many years, but um, since yeah, that was a common practice or a common fear out when circus visited uh, small towns or any other cities that dogs disappeared. So. I'm not, I cannot say that that happened for sure, but that was one of the fears and we don't have any, any dog meat consumption at all um, 
at least not that can, we can prove. I can say because there's always the concern. Right. Well, that's a great short answer. Can't get better than that. <laughs> okay, let's see what else we have here. Um, you treat pets who have owners, but what percentage of pets do you treat that are abandoned, so rescued by you, and now many of them are placed in homes? Well, we have to remember that just because of COVID-19, COVID clinics started treating pets. Actually, before the pandemic, we just sterilized owned pets, mm -hmm. animals, and just attended um, the animals that were recently rescued or recently adopted by community members. And so that kept us in a very strong position to help those that were uh, that needed it the most uh, and to also pass uh, uh, the other customers to the veterinary clinics around. The only thing is that the pandemic crashed everyone's economy because we are so dependent on tourism activities. So um, normally we wouldn't be treating uh, pets unless they are very, very poor or they are part of our community outreach effort in areas that are impoverished or very vulnerable. That's the, uh, the only ones that we, we would normally to be very committed to before the pandemic. Mm, so that was one of the big changes with the pandemic then is just switching over. Yes, to help everyone that needed it. Mm -hmm. No questions, Sam's. no questions, you know, like just uh, trust that everyone is, give, is, is, is telling you the truth and if they are calling you is because they need your help. Right. Right. No judgment. Yeah, you know, that is so important because really so many people I feel don't go to the vet or seek help because of fear of judgment and being told that they're doing something wrong. Um, and I think the important thing and so great about IFAL is that we're so open and inclusive and education based. So we always are trying to educate people on these things and, and not pass on judgment. I love that. Thank you, Erica. We have one more question here. Um, how are cats being um, treated, neutered, and spayed? Are they being given um, the mash style or shots or the pill? How are you doing that? So um, our approach for the sterilizations is multimodal anesthesia. So every cat gets not just one analgesic, but two. And, um, and uh, anesthesia is um, multimodal. So if that was a question from somebody that knows about drugs in veterinary medicine, I'm sure that that will be more than enough. But if you... Um, if you other the other uh, people that are not familiar with um so we do give injectable anesthesia two kinds so they are really really deep into surgical plane and we also in fe on um, female cats we also put them under um isofluorin which is the machine and they are breathing the anesthesia during all the process um and uh, yeah, they can recover much faster. And all the protocols that we have are just like you have in the States. Just as every clinic that will do spay and neuter in the States, we have the same standards as one, uh, one of, of your amazing veterinary clinics of uh, spay and neuter. That's amazing. I love that. Yes, we are, we are very... Um, we as I for are very proud that our partner is, uh, they, they comply with such a high standard. Yeah. That's so great. These are people's pets who they love so much. So I love that they're getting such awesome care. Thank you, Erica. So that's really um, short. So that is all the questions that we are going to go over today, but we're so appreciative to have you back with us, Erica, taking the time. I know you had such a busy, busy day. 
So taking the time to answer all these questions, I know our supporters are gonna so appreciate it. It's my pleasure. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to have um, a chat with you. Yes. Bye, everybody. Thank you.